Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is David Forster, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, introduction to soil minerals here. So this is going to be remarkably similar to last year's presentation. I pretty much am a uh, one-trick pony. I do one thing, and this is it. And so if you're here last year and you don't want to hear it again, you may leave. Uh, if you um, are slight, somewhat insane and you were here last year and you do want to hear it again, you're welcome to stay. Um, this, my goal today is to sort of demystify some of the stuff that other people will be talking about at the conference, give everyone sort of a rough baseline of minerals, soil balancing, soil testing, how to understand that, how to approach that. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is what we're going to talk about here is a very, um, it's, it's a somewhat, it's rudimentary, and what I'm going to talk about is very chemistry oriented um, and very um, simplistic, and that's by design, and that's because it, you could easily get overwhelmed, and the rest of this conference you may very well get overwhelmed with all of the different things that people tell you you can do and try and this and that. I'm trying to give you one simple thing. If you can go home with one thing to try and work on, you can do this one, you can think about it this way, and then you add in the other things as you understand them and want to continue. And with that sort of uh, setup, what I'm going to talk about actually doesn't matter. <laughs> so we're going to talk about soil minerals and soil mineral balance, but if you have a long enough time horizon to get results, you don't need to worry about this. Um, if you support the biological systems, your soil minerals will eventually work themselves out and you can get good growth without adding lime or any other minerals to your soil. Of course, you might require a timeline on the order of like geological timeline, like you know the glaciers and such, because <laughs> it's just a fact that sometimes your soil doesn't have the minerals or it doesn't have the minerals in a way that the plants can easily unlock them. So therefore, that's why we look to add things. We look to add things when nature hasn't given us everything we need in, the appro in appropriate amounts, in the appropriate ratios, et cetera. Um, so that's the sort of caveat. Like a lot of other people talk about the biology and the biology trumps everything, and I absolutely 100% agree. Biology will trump chemistry all day long. Um, but in order to set up the conditions for biology to do really well, sometimes a little bit of uh, that chemical, and not, not chemical from like a synthetic dangerous chemical perspective, but a chemical from a chemistry perspective is appropriate to think about how I can create better conditions for life to thrive. So with that very long rambling introduction, um, I'm David Forrester, I forgot that part, and I work for the Bionutrient Food Association. I also do private consulting and have a private consulting company when I'm not um, overworked by the BFA, um, <laughs> which is great, I love it, so I'm not complaining. Um, and uh, I can be reached at agronomy at bionutrient.org. Um, I do, so when you leave here, you're probably going to be somewhat like more perplexed than you came. Hopefully you'll know some more things, but you also realize there's a lot of things you don't know. That's fine. That's normal. Um, there's some, these presentations will be made available. This will be. So if you don't feel like you just scribble all your notes, um, it will be on the website hopefully soon uh, after the conference. I do free agronomy conference calls, free as in like free free. Um, don't need to be a member to join them. And you can go to this link, tiny.cc slash soil help, and learn about when the next one is. There currently isn't one scheduled, um, because with the lead up to the conference, I just have too much other things going on. So, But there will be another one, probably beginning of January-ish. And it's an hour to an hour and a half on the phone. Get to ask your questions. If you're the only one on the call, it's a one-on-one -on -one free consulting time with me. If other people are there, I take questions in the order they come in. We have a form for questions that you can submit ahead of time so that you kind of bump yourself up the, <laughs> up the priority for getting your questions answered. So that's one. Um, I do one-on-one -on -one and group consulting through the BFA as well. For mem That's a member benefit, um, uh, but it uh, is much discounted for members. Um, and then local chapters are a great resource. If you have a chapter, a lot of people in that chapter will probably have done this, heard this, uh, and they can very often help you look at your soil tests and figure out what you need. Um, some chapters are, are mineral depot sites where they're working on helping to source minerals either through us or through other local resources. So they're great resources for people to learn more and to keep talking about it and demystifying all this. Um, so it, 
show this picture not because like I love you know monoculture uh, sunflowers, uh, but because this picture is actually pretty good. It's kind of crazy the story behind this and what soil mineral balance can do, and and how even though soil mineral balance may not be the most important thing, biology, like I said, being more important, it is enough to get you some really crazy, amazing results, even if you don't delve into the biology side. This field um, was barren. It is in um, uh, western Minnesota, and it's in an area that is like ridiculously flat. It's like a one inch uh, one inch slope over like a fi of over five miles. So it's flat. Um, like you, it's hard to pour concrete that flat. Like it's like, it, yeah, it's flat. And so it, nothing drains, nothing leaches out. And so over time, and it was an ancient seabed and so there's salt deposits everywhere. And this field, when it was, when, when we started working on it, was close to 30% sodium. The soil was white. It is like pure clay. It was hard as a rock. It basically was like concrete. N nothing would grow. Nothing at all would grow. Like it, weed wouldn't grow. And this was after just like two, it might have been three years after starting with just simple mineral balancing, addressing the sodium by adding the calcium that was needed to counteract it. And this was the result. I mean, nothing special. It went from like barren, the farmer had literally stopped bothering to farm it because nothing would grow. And basically, it, most farmers, when I show up and or people like me show up, um, they're like, well, I don't really believe you that you can do anything, so why don't you take my worst field, and if you can do something there, then, which you won't, then I'll pay you. And um, <laughs> so we get to work on this stuff. Uh, and then when we do this, they are like, oh, OK, maybe I'll pay you. Maybe. <laughs> so um, anyway, so this is this is cool. I have other stories like that. I would try not to try not to blab around too much, but um, it really does work. And it, you learn this foundation, you can do a lot, and it'll take you very far. And you don't feel like don't feel like you need to know everything or do everything. Um, if you just make small uh, take small steps, you'll potentially get some really great results. So we're talking about intro to soil uh, minerals, and I want to talk about. What is soil fertility? And so I have a definition of soil fertility, and that is that it, soil fertility is an appropriate balance of the various components of soil that support life. So it's a balance of clay, sand, silt. Those are the sort of physical components of soil. Water, oxygen, carbon dioxide minerals, and organic matter, or carbon. Um, when these things are not in balance, you have a system that does not function at its most efficient, it's not optimized. And so our role as stewards of our land, stewards of our farm, growers of produce and things, uh, is to try to get that system more in balance. Um, and the imbalances can take many forms. So like the, it, you could have an imbalance of, of just, you know, of any one of these things. You have an imbalance of oxygen and water, where your, your soil is so saturated and so hard and compacted that oxygen can't get in, water doesn't go anywhere, and it becomes anaerobic, and life won't live there. Um, interestingly, like a lot of those types of balance issues, including the oxygen water question, are solvable with, no with nothing more than some organic minerals in the right amounts, at the right times, in the right way, and we'll talk a little about that. Um, but for instance, that type of soil, an, an undraining, um, oxygen deprived soil almost always needs calcium because it has too much of a different cation like magnesium and potassium. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a detail in a minute. But that's the kind of thing we'll be talking about here is that like if you have this problem, how do you address it with the minerals? And then what is the result that you can potentially see? Yes. Oh, so the diagram, um, it's really not important to know. It's there because it's a very traditional agronomy picture of the components of soil. So what it is is this is clay up here and sand down here and silt here. And so if you've heard of like a sandy loam, they, it's like it's in this part of this circle, or uh, this um, graph. So it would be, you know, 80% um, sand to 50% sand roughly. And it's going to be, you know, um, 
uh, you know, zero to 50% silt, that's how you read that. It's a very typical chart of soils used by agronomists. It's basically useless for the home gardener. It doesn't actually matter, other than when you talk to an agronomist and they ask you what soil type you have, they're gonna, this is what they're talking about. Do you have a loam? Do you have a clay? Do you have a sandy loam, sand, whatever? That's what they're talking about. Um, it's, there's some ways of measuring that with your hands, crumble, like crumble tests and things. Um, some of those just don't really matter though. Like that so the, the so sunflower picture was basically pure clay. Um, knowing that doesn't necessarily tell you how to fix it um, unless you have other information. So um, yeah, hopefully that's not overly confusing. But um, So with soil and soil fertility, the key thing to realize is basically if you're not building soil fertility, you're destroying it. If you're not actively making it better, you're going backwards. I pretty much guarantee it because you're not balanced on that knife edge between getting better and worse. So if you can't go out and say, this year my soil is better than last year, it's probably, you're probably not doing it right. And so what we want to do is try to figure out what can we do, these little things, to make it a little better. And that is that compounds in a way that is really powerful. In a very short amount of time, you can make dramatic improvements. And so over these geological time frames, I mean, this is how the Great Plains ended up with dozens of feet of soil um, when the, you know, at their prime, not because someone came and dumped like lots of topsoil there, but because it grew out of the parent material of that soil. So the rocks, the minerals, uh, and then the organic matter and the carbon from the plants created that soil. And you can do that in your gardens, you can do that in raised beds, you could do it probably in potted plants, although it's a trickier thing to try to balance. But um, that fi focusing on that, that's our, that's our goal in my mind when you're talking about healthy soil is we're not even talking about healthy soil as a static system, we're talking about healthy soil as a living, vibrant, growing, and improving soil system. Um, and so it's a very different sort of holistic, systemic approach to it. And so pedogenesis is just this fancy word for creating soil. It is, um, and it's a function of this. This, is the, the, uh, this Russian geologist came up with this equation, basically, to define uh, something that is common sense. And basically, it is, soil is a function of the climate, the parent material, and the biological processes. The climate in the way that soil is influenced by climate weathering of parent material and rock, parent material being that rock and gravel or whatever else, and then the biological processes, the living plants, the soil microbes, et cetera, that can take parent material, rock, uh, strip things off of it, build it into organic compounds, and cycle that over and over again to build soil. So I'm bringing all this up because um, it's the way I think is, it's a good way of thinking about soil. So you don't just think about it as that stuff you grow your plants in, that thing that's really hard and obnoxious to try to dig into because something's not right. But thinking about it in this, like it is a change, ever evolving, changing system that we're trying to um, make work just a little bit more efficiently. And so our job is accelerating pedogenesis. So what we want to do is create the conditions where um, our, lo our localized climate, our microclimates are better. So we can use things like mulch to affect the climate of the soil. Uh, we can irrigate to affect the climate of our soil. Um, we can bring in minerals, that would be parent material, part of that equation. So we can bring in rock dust, we can bring in um, all sorts of different fertilizers and, and, and mineral sources. And then biolog biology, so biology includes the plants we grow, it includes all the microbes in the soil that uh, work with those plants uh, and produces, produce uh, healthy soil. And so if you want to accelerate soil building, we need to a focused look at all of those different pieces. How can we make a more uh, balanced um, climate or environmental conditions for our plants? How can we uh, add the minerals we need to in the right balance? And then how do we support the biology? And so now we're going to start talking about um, sort of the more concrete um, soil mineral P 
piece. So when we're talking about soil, what you should, one, a framework I like to use is when we're talking about the minerals in soil, is to think of it as a box. Think of our soil as a box. And all along the outside of that box, you can stick elements, minerals. So hydrogen, iron, um, iron calcium, manganese, etc. You st they stick to the box. And cations stick to the outside. And because there's an electrostatic charge, uh, the box and the cations want to want to attach themselves to each other. And in clay, that box is actually not so much a box, but flat sheets. And so, because clays are basically made up of tiny, very, very, very tiny sheets of material, aluminum silicates, and they have more surface area and binding sites for these things to stick. And so when we're talking about a nutrient holding capacity of a soil, the most important part of it um, is the clay component. So if we have a very sandy soil, we actually can stick very few of these elements to it. The rest will just kind of be floating around. They won't actually be stuck to that soil. If we have lots of clay, we can stick a whole ton of them on there. And they're going to stay there, and they're going to be there when we need them for our plants. Organic matter is another whole piece, and I'll talk a little about that in, in the future. Any of you who know a little about this know that organic matter also holds those minerals, but they do it in a little different way, and so it doesn't lend itself to the same kind of analysis. So we're going to keep things simple and just talk about this clay component. <coughs> so beginning of the 30s, uh, William Albrecht did a lot of research on um, animal nutrition, animal health. And his results basically showed that cr um, crops and, and foods fed to livestock resulted in the he healthiest livestock when the soil minerals approached um, this kind of a ratio. So this 68% calcium, 12% magnesium, 4% potassium, and 1% sodium. Then that was like universal. Like he went all over the world to try to figure out um, where the he how to grow the healthiest livestock, how to get the healthiest crops. And he basically found like no counterpoints to this. The closer a soil resembled this, the better everything did. Um, and so that basically led him to the idea that maybe there is a, just an, an ideal soil balance. Um, and, and then fertilizer companies came along and that idea went bye-bye. And even today, uh, there are lots of people who will, would take what I'm saying about this and say that I'm completely, totally wrong and that's total bullshit. Fine. That's okay. I, I don't care. Um, there, the other way of thinking about it is something called sufficiency levels. So the other side, I'm going to tell you the other side, um, is basically that as long as you have a certain bare minimum amount of that element, it doesn't matter what the balance of ratios and percentages are, because plants will find it. A lot of that is based on the idea that plants only take up nutrients in soluble form. If it's not water soluble, it's not available to plants, done. Okay. So in that, that system basically treats soil like a hydroponic system. If the mineral isn't soluble in water, the plants can't get it. Therefore, we need lots of soluble fertilizers to grow plants in a giant hydroponic system outdoors and destroy the Great Plains dozens of feet of topsoil. So that's the alternative to this, basically. You got soluble or you have plant available but insoluble. And that's what William Albrecht basically was getting at with his research was that the nutrients, for whatever reason, he couldn't necessarily identify exactly how plants take up those insoluble minerals, but the, his research was basically showed that um, on the soil test that looks at insoluble but available as well as soluble, if it's in this range, you get the best results. And I can't say that it's 100% true, except that when I apply it and when I've seen it applied, it actually bloody works. I mean, it works. Like, it really works. Um, so whether it works because it's some, you know, it's luck and it just keeps working for some weird reason, or if there's really something to it, I'm not, you know, you can decide on your own. But if you have this, so this ideal balance in your soil, you will end up at a pH of 6.4 every time. So for people who 
think pH, they're like in the back of their mind, people have told them, you know, I have an acidic soil, my pH is too low, I need to raise my pH. I have an alkaline soil, my pH is too high, I need to lower my pH. Um, it means if you have a pH other than 6.4, you don't have this. And if you don't have that, you don't have ideal soil. Interestingly also, if you do have 6.4, you may still not have an ideal soil because each of these elements affects pH in a different ratio, a different amount of impact on pH. So that's a little, little jab at pH. It's a really poor measurement of soil quality. It basically tells you nothing. <laughs> it, or it tells you something, but it doesn't give you any information on what to do about it. So you might have a low pH, uh, but the solution may not be to add just any old limestone. It may be a very specific need in your soil. Or there's some cases, actually, like that sunflower picture. They had a pH of, I think, 8.1. So who in the room, if you had a soil test said with a pH of 8.1 would add lime? Anybody? Anybody? OK, great, good. Um, yes, so if you have a pH of 8.1, no one in the right mind would add lime. Unless you have 30% sodium and you're in a basin in east, uh, western uh, Minnesota and you want to grow some sunflowers. Because if you have uh, like an 8.1 so, uh, pH, you could have, it's really hard to get that high if you have just a lot of calcium. You're, you can get there if you have a lot of, a, a lot of magnesium. But really what, what drives your, your pH up is high levels of potassium and sodium. They have the biggest impact on pH. So in that case, when they had 30% sodium and 12% potassium and 30% magnesium and like 10% calcium, their pH was 8.1. And we added, I believe it was 10 tons of high cal lime to the acre, uh, which you know, every single mainstream agronomist in, would tell you that's absolutely insane. Uh, but that's how you do it. And what happens there is you're balancing an out-of-balance system to bring it more in balance. So limestone has calcium. Sometimes it have mag has magnesium if it's dolomite. And if you have an excess of, say, sodium pota and potassium, the only way to address it, um, the, the only way is to add calcium. Because calcium will counteract it and it will lower over time your sodium and your potassium. Um, and so that's the key sort of, the key takeaway today is it really is as simple as if you are low in something, you add it. And if you're high in something, you stop adding it. And you add the antidote, if you will. And so we're going to talk a little bit about like what those antidotes are and how to address that and analyze it. So that was high cal lime and not gypsum? That was high cal lime. We also added gypsum. We added both. And the key thing there, um, you bring up, so gypsum is great. Gypsum is calcium sulfate. And it's ideal when you have an excess in a different cation, like magnesium, potassium, and sodium. However, gypsum does not work well at all any th with, when calcium percentage is below 60%. It barely works at all, like at all at all, below 50%, especially at like 20 or so where we were at. So gypsum would have just sat there. It wouldn't have done anything for us. So we had to add the limestone to get the system working to actually enable gypsum to do its work. So but the carbonate didn't skew your the what? The carbonate like did that affect your pH much? Nope. Because the pH the of uh, the pH of the carbonate, I believe, is not much higher than eight point one where our soil was anyway. So there's it can't really raise it uh. from that point. And so all it did is as the calcium got to work and it drove out sodium, the pH just, just slowly just drop, drop, drop. Um, and two years later, I think it was at like a seven. So. And it precipitated, I guess? Yeah, what it does calcium is the, the calcium, yeah, exactly. It moves it down further in the soil profile. It doesn't get rid of it, but it gets it out of the, the part of the soil that you're actively growing in. So the top six inches is what's generally thought of as the growing zone. Realistically, um, any farmer or grower worth calling themselves that should be farming the top foot or more. That can be hard to do, but that is something to uh, uh, strive for. Um, sometimes I've seen places that are growing really on the top one or two inches, and that's a very, that's a very uh, tenuous system, but sometimes that's where you got to start to make progress and have, thing, have the calcium leach down, open up your soil, and, and improve over time. Your roots get deeper. Um, so. 
Yeah, hope, did I confuse you? That was good. No. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, and so the, the BFA and in my consulting work, uh, we use soil tests that are very similar to the way uh, William Albrecht did them in the 30s, and Neil Kinsey continues to do them today. Um, there's basically two labs that I found that I really like and really trust, and that is Logan Labs, which is what the BFA uses, and the Neil Kinsey lab called Perry Labs, which I highly recommend, except that you have to work with a Kinsey consultant, which is rather expensive. So um, the Logan Labs is great because they give you, they're reasonably priced, they give you great results, and you can do it on your own, analyze it, or you can pay to have someone help you, or if you're a BFA member, you can, um, I can help you. Um, you have to be patient with me because I'm wearing too many hats, so sometimes it takes a long while to get back to people, but uh, I will eventually if you bug me enough. So, um, But I'm going to try to give you today an outline of how you can do it on your own. Um, I don't expect everything to stick, but, um, but it'll at least sh give you um, some exposure to these ideas. Um, and actually, before we do that, we're going to run through some, some of the minerals individually, but before you... I think you're all probably scribbling this down. You don't actually have to scribble this down in your paper because on the far left side, like in the, in the margin, uh, I have written this in that margin, basically. Um, and this is also on our website, so um, trying to make things easy for you uh, as much as possible. Um, and, but we will come back to this. We'll come back to the soil report. Um, if anyone's brought their soil reports with them, um, when we get to the point we're going through this, you can raise your hand and ask about your own, and we can use some other examples as well if we have time. So, um, and I'm going to be, and actually on that topic, I will be around this afternoon and tomorrow, um, probably locking myself in a room somewhere to um, help people one on one with soil, their soil tests. And if I have too many people coming all at once, I will put a sign up sheet so you can sign up for like a 15 minute block. Um, and I, my intention is people can just come and listen and listen to the discussion about other people's soil tests. So if you don't have your own, you can learn something that way. So I haven't figured out which room yet or the time, but I will try to make sure that that gets disseminated somehow. Um, yes? Question before we start. Yeah, yeah. Um, I understand, you know, you explained already the, the, you know, the idea of balanced soil. And so normally we talk about calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium, the relation between them. Yes. But what, what about the target values for the soft soil? The yes. Soil and the Okay, so they come from um, a best guesstimate over lots of time and research and observations of, of what seems to work well. So one of the, th you bring up, we talked about cations, we talked about the cation balances, and those are the ones that are indicated in percentage, and we'll talk about that and why that is in a minute. The ones that are in PPM, which is parts per million, those are, with some exceptions, like here, those are anions. Okay, so that's the part that doesn't stick to clay in the same way that cations do. Cations are electrostatically bonded, if you will, to clay loosely. Um, anions are actually technically repelled from it. It's a, they have a different charge. And so the anions like sulfur, phosphorus, boron, those are not going to stick to the clay in the same way. So we treat them a little different. We actually treat them very much like conventional agronomy in a sufficiency level kind of way with the caveat that there are relationships between those anions, the, the anions to each other and the anions with some of the cations that we have to keep balanced in, in mind. For instance, like you want sulfur and phosphorus to actually be pretty close to the same number. And if one's high, you kind of want to push the other one a little higher to balance it. Um, so there's things like that, which we'll talk about in a little more detail um, in a little bit. Um, okay. so. Let's move on here. So um, the ver really high level takeaway from today is, is on this one slide. If you want to improve your soil, these are the ways you do it. You get a soil test, so you have to know what you're working with. That's what I tell everyone because it's one of the simplest things that can put numbers to it. At least that's how my mind works. I want to see something a little more concrete than just trying to go out and visually look or smell the soil, which I do, by the way. You Everyone should start smelling their soil and other people's soils. Um, people look at me weird. That's cool. Um, stop killing microbes. That's a big one. I mean, most people uh, inadvertently end up killing microbes all the time. It is pretty much inevitable. Like, you take a footstep in the garden, you're going to kill something. But 
what you want to do is try to figure out ways to minimize that. And so overwatering, underwatering, leaving bare soil, monocropping, so try to have lots of species, um, keeping a well manicured <laughs> yard, you'll kill a lot of uh, microbes. Uh, lo there's lots of ways to kill microbes. Um, and stop not doing them is basically the way to uh, have better microbial populations. So that's really important. Address your mineral deficiencies and your excesses. Addressing the deficiencies is easy. You've got a deficiency at it. Excesses is a little more complicated, and we'll talk about it. Um, the bottom line, if you have excesses, is you try to bring the other things up to at least a good level as quickly as possible, because that will start to counteract a lot of the negative effects of having that excess. Um, the more close to balance things are, the less the extremes matter. Um, grow microbes, so you can use inoculants, uh, beneficial nematodes, improve your diversity of insects, uh, which can help a lot to um, build resilience in your system. Return organic matter to your soil, feed your microbes. Um, I don't think, I didn't really put up here, but basically, uh, the last one gets to it. Most importantly, really, is to grow healthy crops on that soil. Best way to grow s healthy soil is to grow healthy plants, which of course is a bit of a chicken and the egg problem, because it's hard to grow good plants without good soil. Uh, and that's where paying attention to trying to some of the things that like John Kempf will talk about, or if you were here yesterday, probably did talk about, which was using um, foliars and various like sort of plant nutritional supplements at key points to try to maintain the health and vigor of your plants. So you can actually, you can take really poor soil and use some of those approaches with foliars to grow healthy plants even in that poor soil. And all the extra sugars and photosynthetic energy that those plants capture, they dump into the soil and it very quickly can take like totally dead soils and bring them to life. Um, I had one client I worked with that um, in order to afford their farm, they sold their topsoil. Uh, and so then they hired me to grow it back. <laughs> I'm like, this is cool. I've never done this before. I show up and it's a gravel bank, like liter legit gravel bank. They could have kept going and selling gravel. Um, their exchange capacity, which we'll talk about and haven't yet, and if anyone knows it, their exchange capacity was like 2.2, I think. So it was like pure sand. Um, and we did this. We did lots of like the John Kemp style, like hit it with everything, nutritional therapies, foliars, soil drenches, and six months later we had grown a half an inch of dark, rich, beautiful topsoil on a gravel bank. Um, and change, we changed some management practices like stop them from overgrazing their livestock on it was a big help too, but you can do some amazing things and you can take really poor soils and if you support that and give that what it needs, what it's most in need of, you can do some really cool things. So, um, so that's, that's really important. Um, and then I just want people to know this. People, other people have talked about it. 1% increase in your organic matter will hold an inch of rain. Um, and 20, 20 pounds of nitrogen sequesters uh, 12,000 pounds of CO2. Um, so that's powerful stuff. And 1% increase in organic matter is not that hard. Um, you have to you know, stop killing stuff. And you have to stop doing things that like drive that out. But, um, it's totally doable. It's, it's very, and, and that gives you so much more resilience in your system to then um, deal with droughts and other types of, and you know heavy rains and things like that. So, all right. So I'm going to kind of try to do this next section quick. I'm probably talking really quick already, so you're all probably like, for the love of God, not faster. But uh, in order to get through it, I'll just go quickly. You don't need to. Memorize this. You don't really need to even ha take anything away from it. I just want you to start thinking about um, minerals and mineral balance and what it means for your soil. It's not just what we don't care about the ideal balance just because we want our soil test to look good. We care about it because of the functions that those minerals have in our in our systems. So calcium is probably the number one, arguably the number one most important one in terms of trying to get balance. And it's not listed on fertilizer. It's not considered fertilizer. Um, it's used in every plant cell. Uh, it's the, uh, this calcium pectate, lipid calcium pectate layer. That is, when it's healthy enough, when you have enough calcium and the phosphorus needed to create that lipid layer, um, you are immune to fu most fungal diseases, period, like full stop. Like early blight in tomatoes and things like that. Um, 
the fungal hyphae can't get through that layer if it's th thick enough to actually infect the plants. The spores can land on it, they can do their thing all day long, and you won't get blight. Um, same with an awful lot of other diseases that are big problems. So oftentimes calcium has some serious ramifications in terms of plant health and um, you can pretty much, if you can maintain balance, not just in calcium, but across the board, you become immune to most pathogens, pests and diseases. So it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, and so this is where inadequate calcium leads to tight soils prone to compaction. And that's because what s calcium does is it helps to flocculate your soil. Don't worry about that word. But basically, you got your plates of clay. And if you have low calcium, they stick closely together. And they're very uh, sort of gooey. And not much can get in and out of them. Water gets trapped. Minerals get trapped. And so even if your soil test says you have plenty of potassium, let's say, a bunch of it might be stuck between the layers of clay. You add calcium those layers actually get a little further apart and they start to sort of granulate and become friable. And that's when if you put your hand in a nice healthy soil, it's crumbly, it has a structure to it. You don't really, you can't get that if you don't have adequate calcium. And if you have <coughs> inadequate calcium and oh, too much magnesium especially, you'll find that's when people define their soil, like they'll, they'll crust and they'll crack. They'll become like slimy basically if they get wet because water can't actually even get into them. So that is a good, very good sign of, too of not enough calcium uh, or, not, or too much magnesium or both. Um, sources uh, are limestone. So we have two types of lime. We have high cal and dolomite. Dolomite has calcium and magnesium. If you need magnesium, it's a, it can be a good option. Um, many people in New England apply lime because they're trying to address a pH issue. And in a lot of places, they already have too much magnesium and dolomite ends up actually setting them back. You go backwards. Um, high cal lime, just calcium. You have uh, gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. And then uh, bone meal, wood ashes also have a lot of calcium. Some, a lot of compost can also have fair amounts of calcium. Uh, Eggshells. Um, uh, most of the f organic, um, I think all, actually, of the organic phosphorus sources also come with lots of calcium, uh, which can be tricky if you need phosphorus and you already have too much calcium. Um, because it's hard to get one without the other. But um, just so you're aware, those are the different sources. Um, magnesium, also not listed on fertilizer. Uh, it's also a cation like calcium. It's essen absolutely essential for photosynthesis. It's at the b center of every chlorophyll molecule. If you don't have magnesium, you do not have photosynthesis. Um, it's very prone to tying, being tied up in the soil and not being available. Um, Oh, too much calcium can make it unavailable. Too much magnesium can make it unavailable. That's a weird one. Basically, if you have a lot of magnesium, you may very well end up with magnesium deficiency symptoms in your plants. The reason is, as I was saying, those layers of clay, they get stuck really close together. Well, a lot of that magnesium can get trapped between those layers, and the plants won't be able to access it. Or the, wa or the soil becomes so tight, it becomes anaerobic, and the roots lose their effectiveness at getting the minerals. So I've seen soils so high in magnesium that they have magnesium deficiency in plants. And so oftentimes you have to foliar spray magnesium while you're trying to get rid of magnesium in your soil with calcium. So um, anyway, just that's uh, the magnesium sources, dolomite lime, magnesium calcium carbonate, magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salt, sulpomag as well, which is also called K-mag. Um, all of these are available in both organic and non-organic versions. but. Um, We'll move on, potassium. So this is the third number reported on fertilizers. So uh, potassium sulfate is 0, 0, 0,050. So if you go to conventional commercial fertilizer dealer, um, you might say, I want potassium sulfate. And they'll look, like you look at you like you have three heads. And then you'll say, uh, oh, oh, 0,050. And they're like, oh, yeah, got, we got that. Um, so that's what that is, potassium sulfate. Um, 0060, however, is potassium chloride. It is not good. That chloride thing has a tendency to kill, kill soil microbes. So avoid that one if you can. It is like 95% of the world's potassium fertilizer is potassium chloride. So it's tough, tough, sometimes tough to avoid, but try to get potassium sulfate. Um, potassium maintains the electrolytic balance in plants uh, in many ways similar to how people and livestock work and use potassium. Um, they use it throughout their, their liquid movement system throughout plants. And so it is very important for um, drought tolerance. 
for that reason. If you don't have enough potassium, the electrolytic balance gets out of whack and things are more susceptible to drought. Um, it's also absolutely vital for protein synthesis. So if we want to create plants that don't just have a lot of sugar, but have proteins and have um, more complex um, molecules produced, potassium is absolute must have. You cannot get super high quality foods without the potassium there. So um, the, uh, if you have tomatoes that don't ripen fully, like they ripen on the bottom, but right around the shoulder of that tomato is still green, it's very often a potassium deficiency issue. Um, even in soils that have a lot of potassium, like um, you, in, in the middle of summer when it's dry, you may have a potassium availability issue, or you've just done such a good job of growing your tomatoes, they've actually used up a lot of potassium, um, and sometimes a little supplementation will help a lot to get ripening to uh, plants to ripen fully. The other one is lodging. If you ever have plants, if you grow uh, any grains, this is a very common problem. They'll fall over and makes harvesting a nightmare. But other plants will lodge too. They'll fall over. And potassium, along with copper, are very important to prevent lodging. So that's another use for this particular mineral. Um, potassium sources, potassium sulfate, that 0050. Sopomag, which is sulfur, potassium, and magnesium. So good if you need all three. Green sand, wood ashes, manure, there's lots of other sources, but those are just some of the some highlights. Um, kelp meal has usually about uh, 2 to 4 percent potassium as well, and that's a great one. Um, so sodium, not listed on fertilizer. It's a cation. Usually only looked at as a problem when it's in excess. There are a few crops that require uh, a bare minimum level and will actually do better with a little, little better a little more sodium if they're deficient. Um, if you're 1% sodium or so, um, 1 to 2, then adding a little bit of like sea salt can actually be beneficial. You get um, better, better um, drought resistance, better flavor sometimes, and, and improved uh, overall vigor of plants for somewhat, it's a little, not entirely sure why, because they don't exactly know what it is about sodium that plants need and why they, why they show an improvement, um, as my understanding. Um, this is an important one. If potassium plus sodium ever gets above 10%, you can have serious issues with manganese availability, even if you have plenty of manganese. Um, and the other thing, if you're growing a crop for livestock, um, hay uh, included, if you end up with too much <coughs> potassium, you can kill livestock and kill animals. So, um, we talk a lot about deficiencies, but sometimes the, um, the excesses are worse. And potassium is one of those that um, uh, you can cause really dramatic problems really quickly if you go have an, uh, an excessive amount. Of it. If you are excessive, the solution usually is to bring your calcium up as soon as you can. I mean, that's um, I'm a, usually a pretty much a broken record on that subject. It's like, when in doubt, bring your calcium up to perfect and most problems <laughs> go away. Um, <coughs> Sodium, ocean minerals is probably the best, but there's lots of, sodium is, a, is common, so. Um, what time is it? Uh, okay. So nitrogen is not on soil tests, so not on this type of soil test anyway. It is an anion it, in most forms. Anyway, yes. <laughs> um, it's an anion. There are some forms of it uh, that you can get that will stick to soil. Ammonium, um, uh, the ammonium forms will stick somewhat, but they're volatile. It is very, it is absolutely essential. It's absolutely essential for plants. It's absolutely essential for all life. Um, but it's also very easy to overdo. And it's also very tricky. The reason why it's not on a soil test is because it's very volatile and it changes very rapidly. So the time it takes a sample to get to the lab is usually enough time to totally give you just the wrong numbers. Like it, it'll, it'll uh, outgas on the way to the lab. Um, and so the, that's why they don't really do that. You can do on-farm nitrogen measurements. I find nitrogen is nitrogen deficiencies will show up pretty quick in your plants. Um, and so with nitrogen, if you the if you're organic and you're above six percent organic matter, theoretically, if you do everything perfect, if everything goes perfectly, um, you have enough nitrogen to grow a crop, most crops, without any supplemental nitrogen. That being said, normally everything doesn't go perfect. So I like to look at what can I do to bring in a little bit of nitrogen every year in a form that's not going to shut off your natural nitrogen processes. So the prop, <coughs> one of the main problems with synthetic nitrogens or even just high levels of organic nitrogens is 
at high levels, that shuts off the soil biology that fixes nitrogen for you. So you shut off your fertilizer, your free fertilizer potential uh, when you overnight, overuse nitrogen fertilizers. And you can overuse it with manure, compost, any organic nitrogen source, is, you could overdo just like you can with the conventional ones. So um, there's a lot of people that I hear say, like, you, you, um, uh, you, you likely have too much nitrogen. And I actually find in many of my clients in organic world, they actually often don't have enough. Or they're using it only in the spring, so by midsummer they're running out. And if they don't, ha which really only happens if you don't have good mulch and organic, uh, organic activity. But um, it's a tricky one. And I don't have a good, like, simple answer. It's just I want everyone to, like, know kind of what it's about. Um, you do have some sources, uh, Chilean nitrates, limited <coughs> organic use. You've got the better, probably the best sources for organics are, are the um, protein nitrogens, uh, blood meal, feather meal, you got manure, fish fertilizers. Those all have uh, low enough levels of nitrogen, you're unlikely to short circuit your nitrogen production naturally. Um, Chilean nitrate is a sodium nitrate, so if you have too high sodium, you shouldn't use it anyway. And if you're organic, you should check with your certifier because not all of them allow it. And then I do, there's a couple here, these last two, ammonium sulfate and calcium nitrate. They're not organic, they are synthetic. Um, however, you can produce calcium nitrate with um, uh, grass and uh, trickling water through it, basically, so um, with limestone. So, you know, it's not so far off of a natural, um, natural thing. And they are pretty microbe friendly when used in appropriate amounts. You're, they actually are. They're really not bad products, but they are synthetic. I do want to mention them because they are great tools to have if you're not organic and you have um, and you need the nitrogen, especially early spring. Ammonium sulfate helps to wake soils up, um, but blood meal will do the same. But it's super expensive. Um, and yes, the cheapest nitrogen source is a healthy micro population, so that's very important. Yes. So we see a lot of soil tests <coughs> in soils. Mm -hmm. so we have organic matter of maybe one percent, yeah. and uh, pH is maybe seven point eight. Okay. A lot of things may be out of balance. If you needed to have like a general reference, I don't mean to make it too loose, but a general reference to get started with nitrogen. Yep. And you were going to try to put together a fertilizer plan for the year. Yep. Uh, and you are going to try to be microbial friendly. Mm -hmm. General, uh, yeah. Would you try to be like 44 pounds of nitrogen? I've, per, per it depends somewhat on the crop. It's definitely crop specific, how big a yield you're aiming for for that year. Um, if you're trying to grow like record setting bushels of corn, then you're going to need 100 pounds of nitrogen. Um, a good target, though, I like to say is 50. Um, and one of the things, too, is I tell people like um, it's the concentration that really hurts you. So if pl most plants, most crop plants don't need a lot of nitrogen in the beginning. When they're small, they take very little actually. So timing your nitrogen application for when your plants actually need it, for one thing, it, it means less running off into rivers. Uh, but the other thing is just better use of your money. So you might need 50 pounds of nitrogen, but you might want to only put a small amount at the beginning just to get stuff going and then su supplement throughout the year. So that's how I approach it and tell people think about it. Um, phosphorus, um, how are we doing? Okay. Um, phosphorus is the first number reported on fertilizers. So if you have like 10, 10, 10, or 10, 15, 20, or something, the 10, um, sorry, that's actually false. It's the second number. I got to change that. Um, so yeah, the first number would be nitrogen, the second is phosphorus, and the third is potassium. Um, it is required for metabolism, it's required for energy transfer. Um, root development, root initiation, and growth. So it's really important. Um, if you have low phosphorus, you, it is very hard to get um, vigorous plant growth. Um, and so using, um, using the phosphorus fertilizer in that case is, is very important. Um, it certainly can be organic, um, like something like soft rock phosphate, uh, which has a small amount of available and a lot of unavailable phosphorus. The real key with phosphorus, though, is that it is very much dependent upon your microbe population. If you have good microbial activity, um, 
you have a much lower need for supplementing phosphorus. Many, many times you'll see, um, I go to a place and I say, they might be borderline phosphorus levels, but they haven't really done much to support microbial activity. And if I can get them to change some management practices, doing mulching, keeping um, microbes happier, keeping things well irrigated through the year, you can often see the numbers on the soil test go up as the microbes unlock the phosphorus that's already there. Most soils have tens of thousands of pounds of phosphorus in them. There are some that don't, and then you do need to add for sure. But there, many of them have it there, especially old farms that used to use conventional fertilizers. Um, oftentimes it's there, but it's locked up. It's bound to calcium. And just getting better microbial activity, adding the sulfur that's usually deficient, will help to unlock the phosphorus, and you won't have to buy it. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to get the levels in the thousands of parts per million? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you are um, increasing your biological activity like really rapidly, are you afraid that putting too much oh. phosphorus? I've never seen that kind of a problem. No, because the bio, bio, the way it frees it up is it doesn't make it water soluble, it makes it available. So it's not like it's not going to suddenly leach out or, or just. Uh, really cause problems. Now, that being said, if you have high levels of phosphorus, there's a few things you want to make sure you also have good levels of, for instance, potassium and sulfur. Um, of those. And, and the, actually, and the, the really big one is zinc. So if you have high phosphorus, you absolutely need to have high zinc. If you have high zinc, you absolutely need to have high phosphorus. Um, and we'll go into exactly what that means in a few minutes, um, and like what those levels actually should look like. Um, Excessive levels can easily tie up zinc and copper, so that's going to be one of your things. And you can't just add the zinc or the copper to the soil, most likely. It just won't be easily available. You probably want to look at some foliars that contain them to try to make sure you can maintain um, adequate levels for the plant, of the, especially of those two. So, um, Oh, yeah, the, the ways you get it, bone meal, rock phosphate. Um, bat guano, fish fertilizers, those are the organic sources. Um, Monoammonium phosphate, if you're not organic and you <coughs> really must use a uh, synthetic. Um, yes? Actually, I usually see the opposite. Uh, most composts have quite a bit of phosphorus, and the microbial activity that many, many composts ha have and help to spur, I see can often spike phosphorus levels very high. So I, I don't see the, the tie up so much as I see ex excess is built on too much phosphor, uh, compost use. That's more what I've been seeing. But um, Sulfur, very important, not listed on fertilizer. It's an anion. Uh, it will leach in most forms. Um, this is an interesting fact. Uh, most crops need as much sulfur as they do phosphorus, um, but yet it's not on in fertilizers. It's not considered, you know, a, a main uh, a mineral. Um, it's absolutely vital for protein synthesis, uh, nitrogen fixation, uh, and vitamin production. It forms the um, cross-linking for lots of proteins and vitamins and things like that. So if you don't have it, you're not producing as healthy food as you could. Um, the other thing that it does is, if you have an excess in one of the cations, it's like vital to have good levels of sulfur to help remove those and move them out of the system and have the system um, uh, make uh, adjust to the cation levels you want and closer to uh, a balance. Um, some sources are elemental sulfur, which is 90% sulfur. Um, the metal sulfate fertilizer, this would be like potassium sulfate, calcium sulfate. Calcium and potassium are technically metals. Magnesium sulfate, copper sulfate, zinc. Those are great sources. But I want to bring up one very important fact, and that is if you have low sulfur on your soil test, adding the sulfates is not going to fix it. So adding gypsum, you get sulfate. You might think, I'm going to fix my sulfur deficiency. And it's true that you will feed your crop the sulfur it needs. Like Sulfates are available for plants to use to make uh, vitamins and protein and fix nitrogen and things. But it's not going to stick around. You're going to add the sulfates. You're going to soil test. And you're going to say, hey, I added a whole ton of sulfates. There's no extra sulfur. And you'll almost never see an increase, at least not in any reasonable time frame. And that's because sulfates are water-soluble. Sulfates will leach out quickly. Whatever the plants don't use, 
you really aren't going to have it there next year. Um, and so we like that when we're using calcium sulfate, we like the fact that it works quickly because it helps to get rid of our excesses. But when we're trying to build sulfur in our soil, elemental sulfur is really the best way to go. And people could say, like, it you know, kills microbes. Yes, it will. Any microbe, like touching one of those little pellets, is probably going to die because it's got a pH of like 2.5 or 3 or something like that. Um, so it's a harsh environment. But it's slow release. It takes six months to break down. It is a form that is not leachable. And it takes something like 50 uh, biochemical steps to break it down and make it into a water-soluble sulfur compound for plants to use and things. And every one of those steps in that pathway is an opportunity for your microbiology to grab a hold of it and incorporate it into things that won't leach. So that's why it's really effective to, um, to build soil uh, sulfur levels is because it's, it hangs around long enough to do its job. Um, and it also, um, it also helps to liberate the, the, the excesses that you might have, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium. So very important. People don't focus enough on it. Everyone's deficient. I mean, I almost never see uh, a counter example of that other than maybe greenhouse production environments. So um, boron, not listed on fertilizer. Also critical. It's an anion. It leaches. Everyone east of the Rocky Mountains is deficient unless they've been aggressively adding it for about 30 years. Um, so it works to make things available. It acts as kind of the uh, the truck driver for other minerals in plants. Um, so if you don't have boron, it's really hard for plants to get the rest of their minerals where they need it. And so they end up spending more energy just doing simple stuff like moving potassium around or calcium. So if you have adequate boron levels, the whole system works more efficiently. Um, and so a uh, key thing, though, is there's a very low limit to how much you can add in a year, two pounds of actual boron uh, per acre. Uh, if your calcium is really deficient, that's pushing it. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, the sources are things like solubor, granubor, which is a granular form of solubor, which is something, I believe it's 20% uh, boron. So if you have a 20% boron and you need to get two pounds of actual, it means you use 10 pounds of the product per acre. If you have something like borax, which is 14.3% boron, you can use about 15 pounds per acre of borax. So just normal 20 yield team borax you can use to get boron. Um, iron manganese, again, not in fertilizers. They're considered micronutrients. If you buy like micronutrient fertilizer packs, they'll usually contain some. Absolutely critical for chlorophyll formation, uh, energy transport, um, um, enzymes, and nitrogen fixation amongst lots of other issues. Like uh, you can't get good. Um, uh, fertility in livestock and hair growth and color in like uh, um, like sheep and alpacas and things is improved by manganese having adequate manganese. Um, you know, sources generally of these trace elements are usually like the sulfate form, so iron sulfate, manganese sulfate, um, and uh, they're very important. Copper and zinc, the next two, again, they've got critical critical um, protein and human and animal health attributes to them. Um, fiber production in, in, live, in livestock, alpacas, sheep, things, uh, really is, is, is hurting if zinc is deficient. So very important. We're going to go quickly through these. Um, and then there's the micro-micronutrients. So we have things like cobalt, molybdenum, selenium. These are things that aren't always on soil tests. Uh, in fact, if you get a normal Logan Labs test, they're not going to include it unless you use a special form like the one that the BFA has on our website that you can download uh, that will include those for free, um, which is what we've worked out with them. Um, but I mean, vi absolutely vital, poorly sort of understood, although that's changing. Um, it's absolutely essential for vitamin production and, and nitrogen um, fixation. And lots of deficiencies. Like I see it's very common to be, you know, have less than 1% of the goal of the target levels in your soil. So um, it's hard to find, it's hard to get these things. It's hard to handle them. Um, you can get things like cobalt sulfate or cobalt carbonate, but they're really difficult to handle. You could, the maximum application rate is something like four pounds per acre of like cobalt sulfate. So you gotta be really careful handling. You can overdo it 
especially in the case of selenium. It's very, very toxic to breathe it in, for instance, so it can be very difficult. Um, these sources, anything from the ocean, a lot of rock dust like azomite will have some in it. And then the BFA is made up of compost that has them added to it to help make it easier, which um, if, your, if your local chapter is in a, takes part in a mineral depot, you can get access to that, it's, it's, especially if you're local. Um, so, yes? Mm -hmm. Well, I've never put my Geyer counter on it, um, but uh, it, yeah, I don't worry about it, to be honest. Um, if you have a well-functioning soil system, um, really don't worry about that sort of thing. Uh, there are stories of, like, there's been a, there was a biodynamic and organic farm in, like, the Chernobyl fallout, fallout zone that had been amending their soils with boron and do, practicing really good organic practices, and you know everyone thought all the other farms around are, were abandoned, gone, and they went and tested this farm produce and the milk pr produced from it, and there was nothing, no sign of radioactivity. There's a good amount of evidence that boron, especially adequate levels of boron, can actually um, mitigate <coughs> or somehow chelate radioactive particles and make them not available. So I don't worry at all about things like azomite. <laughs> it does have some, but uh, not enough to make a big impact. It's like, you know, a couple parts per million. So if you need boron, add boron. <laughs> it's, and, and, and the thing about boron I didn't mention is uh, if you need boron, you're going to just buy a big bag of it because you're going to have to every year need to add it because the, the amount you can add every year is so small that in order to get up to your target is almost certainly going to take years. But it's cheap. It's like $7 an acre um, if you buy it in bulk. So just buy a 50-pound bag and just every year you put out what you're amount allowed to put out and you'll eventually get there or your kids will. Um, <laughs> all right. Interpreting soil. To, oh, but you don't have to get there to get the benefits. You start seeing the benefits before you get there. So, um, all right. So we're going to do a, spend some time now just looking at these soil test reports. Give you familiarize yourself, familiarize you with them and how to approach them. Um, so the first thing you always want to look at with these is um, is towards the top is total exchange capacity, and so for this we've got 10, 6, 12. Um, and uh, 10, 6, and 12, and that's, that's an indicator or a, a measurement of the nutrient holding capacity of your soil. And so higher clay concentration tends to have a higher exchange capacity, although not always, because the type of clay depends on the exchange capacity. There are um, geologically old and weathered clays that have very low exchange capacity. So saying you have... Um, you know, uh, a high exchange capacity, or a low exchange capacity, therefore no clay, is not always true. Um, do you have a question, Alan? Thank you. Um, yeah. The exchange capacity, how is that different or similar to CEC? Oh, yes. Cation, cation exchange. Um, they're, for all intents and purposes, can be viewed the same. It's, um, there's technically a difference, but... And what does the M-E stand for? Uh, equivalent. It's the units that they're in. Um, but for the sake of keeping things simple and, and really what matters is either it's a CEC or TEC, you can treat them the same for this, for what we're talking about. And if you have anything over about an 8.5, then theoretically you can hold all the nutrients you need for a growing season of annual crops without a problem. You've got enough space on your soil to hold the bare minimum of minerals, especially magnesium is often the one that falls short or potassium. So if you're above 8.5, great, you're in the clear, you kind of, you got a different set of rules. If you're below 8.5, the, the biggest thing that changes is the, uh, the ratio of calcium magnesium. So if you're at 8.5 TEC, your target calcium is 68, your target magnesium is 12, okay? That's, this, this, part's, this part might take this note. If you're lower than that, like if you get down to about 5.5 uh, TEC, your TEC is 5.5, your calcium target is 60% and your magnesium is 20%. The two are always going to equal 80%. So that's another thing, good, good thing to know. If you're, so basically 8.5 or above, you're 68 and 12, calcium, magnesium. 
if you're at 5.5 TEC, your target is 60 and 20 calcium magnesium. And basically, it's, it's a roughly linear curve between that. And online on the BFA website, which I think I have a link to in a couple slides, is a listing of what those numbers are. And so you can go there, um, there's a forum listing with, these, with that number. So, um, so the first thing you do, TEC, because that determines your target for calcium magnesium. The next thing I tell people to look at is calcium. So you skip down to that gray area in the middle, which is the percentage calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium. And there you just compare to your target. So if your target's 68, vegetable garden, that first one, your target's 68 because your TEC is above 8.5. So you've got 59% calcium, you've got 32% magnesium. This is soil, very low in calcium, quite very high, excessive in magnesium. And so this is gonna likely, it, it was in fact a tight soil, doesn't, um, water doesn't infiltrate well, it tends to crack. Uh, you tend to get mineral deficiency issues with any kind of stress in that system. Um, and so in that particular case, you want to look at how can I get calcium up and how can I get magnesium down? Well, good news, by bringing calcium up, you bring magnesium down. So um, you're not going to, leaving here, you're not going to know exactly how to do all this math. There are good books like Ideal Soil by Michael Astera that can help point you in the right direction. They give, he gives you the equations in that book. You can usually find old versions online floating around when it was originally released as a PDF. Um, or he, I support him and buy his book because he's done some great work. Um, and uh, yeah, Ideal Soil by Michael Astera. And that's a really good one. And then some, most of this stuff is also on the BFA website that you, we have some equations up there. Uh, it can be hard to find though, but yes. Mm -hmm. Those are the targets. Mm -hmm. And so, so in this case, one thing you got, got to keep in mind when you're talking about calcium magnesium is when you drop, when magnesium goes down, um, sorry, when calcium goes down, it pulls magnesium with it, and so, um, and vice versa. So you've got 32% magnesium here. We want to go to 12. So that's a 20% uh, act, like 20% change. Um, and so what that means is you're also going to naturally pull 20% of your calcium out. So your calcium is going to want to go, if you don't do anything, over a long period of time, your calcium is going to drop towards 39 as your magnesium drops towards 12, assuming that nothing's being added or nothing is contributing to that increase to keep it where it is. So what that means, though, is that you need to push calcium a lot higher than you think in order to get the magnesium down. So. In this particular case, I might use a little bit of limestone to try to um, get calcium above 60, so gypsum works really well. And then I'm going to use a bunch of gypsum and make sure my sulfur is good to make sure that works. Um, in this particular example, I'm going to just give a rough estimate. So we, up top, and there's calcium pounds per acre. It says we need 354. That's usually a pretty good uh, target for what it would take to bring you to your, your target level of, say, six, in this case, 68%. So Logan Labs gives you that. But what they don't give you is how much extra calcium you need to counteract all that magnesium. So in this case, you need like 350 pounds of calcium to get calcium from 59.38 up to 68. And we know that we need to add basically the equivalent of another 20% to get uh, the magnesium out without driving our calcium too low. And so that's going to actually probably add somewhere in the neighborhood of another 800-ish pounds, maybe 900 pounds of calcium. So our total need for calcium here is going to be somewhere in the 1,200 pound range. And so I might add 200 pounds of calcium in the form of limestone and the rest in gypsum. And so the way you figure that out is you figure out what's my percent calcium in the material I want to use. So high cal lime is about 30% calcium. Gypsum is also around 30% calcium usually. So what you can do is you take that number I need 200 pounds of calcium in limestone, divide by 30, something in the neighborhood of 600-ish uh, pounds of uh, high cal lime. And you do the same thing with the rest of it. So you figure out you need, um, what is that? Uh, uh, 900 pounds, let's say, of calcium and gypsum divided by 0.3. I got two hours of sleep last night, so somebody else do that math for me. Uh, but it's um, probably pushing the maximum application rate for gypsum. And that's the next thing you have to focus on which we have on the website, 
what is your maximum application rate? So gypsum, under normal circumstances, in other words, not when you're in Minnesota and you've got a TEC of 80 and a sodium of 30, your maximum application for gypsum under normal conditions is 2,000 pounds per acre. So you might want to do 200 pounds of calcium and limestone and the rest in gypsum, but you might find that would be too much gypsum and you'd have to compromise. So those are the, the balancing questions. People get, that's where a lot of people get really frustrated, flustered, don't know what to do. Um, most of the time, you won't screw things up too bad, and it takes a lot of time to get this stuff down, so don't feel bad. Just keep trying and join the agronomy conference calls and ask your questions. And uh, yeah, uh, don't stress too much. But um, you had a question, yes. Yeah, so For an acre in this soil, yeah, yeah. Limestone is very often applied in like they measure it in tons per acre, yeah. Um, and so yeah. But the nice thing is it's the cheapest thing to buy, so um, it's actually very cost effective, and the results that it has are well worth the expense and the pain in the butt of spreading thousands of pounds. But you can get but it cheaper to spread it. You can, yeah. If you're on a farm, very yeah, it's very really very reasonable. reasonable if you live close to one of them. <laughs> but most places that have farms have. Uh, lime spreaders and dealers that you can arrange everything through and they'll come with a truck and they'll spread it for you and they'll be done in t 30 minutes and so um question and yeah yeah so what that changes is you might bump into that maximum gypsum application rate a little quicker mm -hmm. um it gets prohibitively expensive but at the same time, once you get it right, you've got this huge bank of nutrition to work from. So you might, it might, it takes a lot more up front, but you get a longer, usually a longer period where you don't have to add things or don't have to add as much. And you can just grow the crap out of whatever you're growing with a big, big TAC. Then the, the field in Minnesota was a TAC of 80, which is why we added like 10,000 pounds of lime and thousands and thousands of pounds of gypsum. And because it was hold it and it needed it. So in order to, so the math to figure out how many pounds is necessary to make a change in the uh, percentage, the fact, one of the factors in that math is the TEC. So the higher the TEC, the more pounds of material it takes to make a percentage change in the mineral level. So, yes? Um, if, so we have, we have our soil test here, but he's saying for the exchangeable cations, it's in parts per million rather than pounds per acre. Oh, yes. Okay, and great. I'm glad you, yep. Like a conversion rate. Yes. Perfect. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so uh, a lot of times you'll see things in pounds, uh, parts per million, PPM, and or in pounds per acre. And thankfully, there's a very easy conversion. You multiply by two. Take pounds, parts per million, multiply by two parts per um, or pounds to get pounds per acre. And that's because the assumption is most soils, six inch, top six inches of soil is two million pounds of soil. So that's why that math is the way it is. Um, and so what that means, and, and I'm going to skip from the cations because we're running out of time and you're not going to leave here knowing how to do this, but you're going to at least know like why and sort of hopefully have a bit of a framework. But sulfur, for, we're going to jump up to sulfur where it's in parts per million, so it's not given in percents. It's because it's an anion. It's a little different math. The nice thing is that's one of the simplest pieces of this whole thing to understand. Um, over on the left, you have a target of 75. Really, uh, 50 is kind of the bare minimum good level. 75 would be actually really excellent if you can get there. And you can, but you got to work on it. Is that 75 PPM? PPM, yes. PPA. That is PPM. Okay. Yep. So 75 parts per million um, is your target. Um, and you're in, uh, uh, you've got 14 on this one. So 14, you need 75. Let's say we're actually only trying to go to 50 because you can't go too fast on this. So 50 is like a bare <laughs> minimum. If you're a lot below 50, use 50 as your target. And then when you get close to 50, bump your target to 75. It's usually the best approach to that. So take your parts per million. You got 14. And you need, say, 50. So you take 50 minus 14. You get 36. So 36 parts per million is how much sulfur you need. You multiply that by 2 to get pounds. So 36 times 2, you have 72 pounds of sulfur necessary. And then to figure out how much elemental sulfur you need per acre, you just divide that by 0 0.9, because that's the percentage of sulfur in elemental sulfur. And you get something in the neighborhood of 80 pounds 
or 85, I think, something in that range, of elemental sulfur per acre. And so that's enough to theoretically bring you to your minimum. Never works. It never works. Don't be frustrated. The reason it never works is because, especially when you have an excess, a whole bunch of that sulfur that you would like to go on your soil test to make you feel good next year goes to eliminating your excess, or at least starting to address it. And it might not change that much for a while, but it, that's where it's going. It isn't, it's not like you didn't throw your money away. Just keep, keep at it, keep testing, keep seeing where you're at. Um, about sulfur, just um, it takes six months to break down. So if you're going to retest and you've added sulfur within the last six months, it's not fully broken down, and it will likely show up higher than it really is on your soil test. So you kind of have to back that out of your mental calculations when you're figuring out do I believe my number? Am I actually close to the target? Or is that because I added sulfur three months ago and it's sitting there still and it went to the lab and got tested? So, is there, uh, is there yeah. a risk for too much elemental sulfur? There is. 100 pounds is the normal max application rate um, under most conditions. You can push it to 200 um, if you really need it and you've got like a high pH and you're trying to work on excesses, especially when you have like high levels of phosphorus, so you're trying to balance that as well. Um, but for general, like you're not going to screw things up purposes, 100 is probably what you should keep in mind. Okay. Yes? I'm wondering about the spread of the slides with barium, strontium, and aluminum, and okay. how that would impact the soils. And yeah. have you noticed that over the years? Um, what can we do about it? I mean, uh, so I haven't noticed anything. I mean, the amounts that, that might be being sprayed and might be landing on our soils are minuscule in comparison to 2 million pounds of soil per acre for six inches. Um, the uh, people don't, I mean, I get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The solution to pollution really is dilution because when you have pollution, microbes can do an awful lot for you as long as it's not at a toxic level and kills the microbes. There's microbes that eat everything, and there's microbes that help to chelate things that are toxic and we don't want, um, we don't want around. Now, strontium, barium, those are things that are in every bit of soil. You go out, you go out now and you get a sensitive piece of instrumentation and you will find those elements in basically any soil sample you find. They exist naturally. They're elements. Um, the key is just, is it at a concentration that's toxic? Um, there are certainly sites where those levels can be too high. And generally speaking, with toxic things, with high lead levels, heavy metals, um, various carcinogens, fungicide, pesticide residues, those things, if you can get a healthy enough soil microbiology, fix some of these mineral balance things so that the system works more efficiently, uh, you can get an awful, you can get, uh, the soil system and the microbes will clean up that pollution for you, chelate the things that you aren't, don't want in your crops. Um, with, for instance, like lead in soil, um, the biggest risk for, for ingesting food grown in that soil is actually from splashing of the soil with, that has lead in it into the, onto the plants. Most things don't, there's, there aren't pathways in most plants to pick lead up and put it into the, into the produce. Uh, with some exceptions like lead wart, I believe, which is a plant out west, that, a native plant that bioaccumulates lead, for instance. But um, most don't have that. So is, growing healthy soils really is also a way of cleaning up our our polluted environment and creating um, creating the capacity to heal the, our environment. So, um, yeah. Do the end of things now or in the uh, Yeah. Um, the best time to do a soil test is yesterday. The best time to add minerals was last week. Um, but that being said, the next best time is pretty much now. But, but uh, if you have, you can add most of these things, you can add all of these things on top of snow. You can add them at any time. The risk, though, is that if the ground's frozen, you got snow on top, and you add these things, and it all of a sudden melts, it's all in your stream. So th that's the risk. But if you suspect, like we're gonna, that's not that's not the case for you. You can go ahead and apply it. Um, most of the minerals that take some time to break down, which is most of them, are best applied in the fall to have time over winter to have break down and get incorporated into your soil and your microbial populations. That being said, if you're trying to, um, like this first soil has got high magnesium and, high cal and low calcium and low potassium, really. If you're adding potassium to feed a crop next year and you don't have the room on that soil necessarily to have it stick, 
you wouldn't want to apply that in the fall because you wouldn't it wouldn't do you any good. You'd be wasting some of that money at least. So you'd apply that in the spring with your crops or side dress along your growing crop throughout the growing year. So it depends on why you're adding it. Um, it's not a simple answer. Things like limestone that take three years to fully break down, you pretty much want to apply it as soon as you can uh, when it's not going to run off for some reason. So when the soil's active before it's frozen solid, uh, preferably, but um, another good time is um, it, just like frost seeding, if you're familiar with that, is when the ground's freezing and thawing a, a lot and often, especially in, in early spring. That can be a good time as long as you're not going to get a big, you know, gully washer rainstorm. Um, but if you've got good mulch and you're not going to have the runoff, then you've got more options. So um, let me just see, make sure. Um, got a couple minutes. So I didn't get qu as far into this as I wanted. That's not surprising. Um, I am around, this stuff is complicated, don't feel overwhelmed. If you've got soil tests and you want me to take a look at them, I'll be around and I'm happy. Just If you see me walking by, smack me and see if I can carve out some time for you to sit down one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to try to get a place to do that um, as well. And then one more thing, we got a couple minutes and then um, just wanted to show um, some pictures. So, the other thing to think about, we got de mineral deficiencies. Sometimes you actually see these things in your plants. And one thing that um, there's a saying like the best fertilizer is the footsteps of the farmer. And a lot of that is because you see, you're, see, you're observing what's going on, you're making uh, management changes. And one of the things you can do is start to see what plants look like when they're stressed by a certain factor, mineral factor, et cetera. So these are a couple uh, links to some pages. One has great descriptions, one has great pictures. Um, to get you started. Um, marijuana growers actually like post pictures of their plants all the time. I think they're like obsessed or something. And so they talk about a lot of these deficiency symptoms like constantly. So if you Google it, you can find it and then you can kind of be like, all right, well that's what it looks like in a marijuana leaf. What's it going to look like in a tomato leaf? And it, it, you know, there's, they're, they look similar enough that you can start to get an idea. But these are some good ones for vegetables that I like. Um, and these are some of the questions you want to look at, like where is the discoloration? Is it in the, on the vein or between the veins? So intervenal chlorosis versus um, the veins itself. Where in the plants that new growth or old? And that's very important for what deficiency you're looking at. Um, leaf spacing. So if all of a sudden your plants are, are growing and suddenly, um, like on tomatoes, you'll have tomato, the, the leaf nodes are like this going up, and all of a sudden it's like, this tall and this tall and the plant's shooting up and it's spindly and that can be caused by like excessive nitrogen and not enough calcium potassium at that particular moment. And so things like that you can watch for um, to see if your plant, how your plants are doing. But like these, so um, we talked a little about it before, but does anyone remember what one possible solution for that one might be? Yeah, people were listening, yeah, cool. Well that, yes, that can do it too. Um, and then the other, what's this one? Who can? Calcium. Ah, good. Okay, good. Not uh, your plants <laughs> yes. And actually, Andrew's bringing up a good point. The mineral stuff, like, you can have perfect minerals, but if you can't maintain hydration, just, you're done. <laughs> so if you're, if you're, like, thinking, what should I invest in? Irrigation, because I have that problem, or the minerals. If you really can't maintain hydration, put your money in there first, because... It's really important. And then this one. This one, does anyone know what this one's called? Um, tomatoes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. That's early blight, right? Yeah, that's early blight. And um, do you know how to make this never occur? Calcium. calcium definitely helps, but if you need potassium as well. Calcium and potassium are the two really critical ones to make sure you don't get that. And, if, and other minerals as well, but those are... If you really have good levels of that, and if you, especially with the f use foliars, you can pretty much never get early blight ever again. Like, don't let your soil dry. What? Don't let your soil dry. Don't let your soil dry. That's what happened. I yeah, no, it's true. Drip tape on the yeah. tomatoes. Yeah. Yep. I was watering the heck out of them. We had a drought, and the levels were fine, but, but we all had the, that. those three things. Yep. Yeah, that'll happen. And like sometimes you'll get clogged drip lines. Like I've seen that before, and it's really frustrating. Um, when you think you're doing anything right, and then you get every problem like that. But um, yeah, 
And then, so mulching sometimes can really help. Like a lot of times, people use black mulch on tomatoes. I tell people, take your black mulch, and as soon as your soil is warm, cover it in hay or grass or straw or anything you can get. Because um, I've seen many times where you've got beautiful tomatoes that are under that black plastic, and midsummer comes around, and the sun's beating down on it, and you stick a therm and the plants start to look like crap. You stick a thermometer down under the black plastic, and the soil is 160 degrees. There's nothing living there. So yeah. just keep that in mind. You know, it's great early spring. It's a good management tool. But try to get it covered with something that's not going to heat up like that. So, All right. Well, that's it. All right.